Do you know what the greatest pleasure is for me? It's nothing complicated or expensive. It's not a costly bottle of wine or a slap-up meal or a new pair of merino socks. It's nothing you have to actually pay any money for, or not directly. It's putting away my paintbrushes after a day's work at my easel, closing the studio door behind me, getting my dog's lead out of the cupboard, and stepping out onto the Edinburgh street on a summer afternoon like this, and then setting off round Drummond Place in all its Georgian splendour with my dog, Cyril, trotting at my side. Cyril, the only dog in Scotland to have a gold tooth, by the way, a great companion, and a good judge of most things, in his canine way, of course. And here we are, Cyril and I, making our way to the flat of Domenica MacDonald in Scotland Street, just a little way down the hill. Domenica MacDonald, anthropologist, conversationalist, observer par excellence of the foibles of others, although I hope she's not too observant when it comes to me. Most of us like to be understood, of course, but not too well understood. Now, Angus, you know the rules. I'm always happy, or nearly always happy, to see you. But I'm afraid I must draw the line at that dog of yours. He stays out here on the landing. Oh. He'll be perfectly comfortable. Dogs are quite content to wait. But, Domenica, Cyril is an intelligent and entirely well-behaved dog who... Happens to smell. That is something that can't be denied, even if he is your best it's friend. What an awful lot of eminently respectable people smelled, you know. Diogenes, who lived in a sort of kennel himself, much admired and supported by dogs, was surely malodorous. And King James the Sixth, one of our more enlightened Scottish kings, was a bit challenged in that department too. <laughs> I could go on. Well, neither Diogenes or James the Sixth would be welcome in my flat then. <laughs> Cyril, you stay out here. The heart that excludes you has shown no signs of softening. Now then, prepare yourself for a bombshell. Mm -hmm. Antonia Collie has moved back in next door. That flat on the landing, the one opposite. Antonia Collie, no less. Oh, Antonia, the person who... Exactly, the person who owns it. Yeah, Antonia, as you may recall, bought that flat some years ago and then promptly went off to goodness knows where, oh, Glasgow, I think, and let the place to those mousy people we never saw. Well, they've been cleared out and she's returned. I see. <sighs> she was difficult, wasn't she? Oh, very. Oh, perfectly well behaved on the surface. But there's something about her I find a bit unsettling. You never know with Antonia... You do know with most people who do and say the sort of thing that you expect them to do and say. Mm -hmm. But with Antonia... Yeah, and what exactly is she doing back in Edinburgh? Well, again, you never know with her. She claims, though, to be writing another book. She wrote something some years ago, a history of the Picts, I believe. It was remaindered almost immediately, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. And now she tells me she's working on a new life of the early Scottish saints. <laughs> of the Scottish saints, I ask you. Most of them were entirely apocryphal, you know. And those that existed were not real saints anyway. No, I don't know. Well, I do, Angus. Uh, didn't you have some sort of row with her? Mm, I certainly did. Uh, not that I started it, of course. Yes, no, no, no. Uh, she did. More or less immediately after she'd bought the place. I remember it very clearly. She came in to introduce herself, and I gave her a cup of tea here in the kitchen. She started to look at the wall in a rather intense way. Has that wall always been there? My kitchen wall? Yes, I, I think so. Or at least it's been there since the early 19th century when Scotland Street was built. Right. You see, the reason I ask is that the geography of your flat is rather different from mine. Oh, many flats are different from one another. I, I don't know the layout of your flat very well, Antonia, but I believe you have one bedroom? Whereas my flat... Appears to have three. Well, not just appears to have, actually has three. Oh, which is interesting, <laughs> is it not? You'd have thought that, bearing in mind the Georgian attachment to symmetry, flats on the same landing would be mirror images of one another. I'm not at all sure whether I'd agree. Some flats are larger than others. Why that should be, I, I don't know. Oh, but that's just my point. 
I believe that we both originally had two bedrooms. Then at some stage in the past, and it may be the comparatively recent past, somebody acquired an extra bedroom by incorporating it within their flat. A wall, I fear, may have been moved, possibly without the appropriate planning permissions. But that's ridiculous. Oh, well, that's what I thought. She more or less accused me of stealing one of her rooms. Can you believe it? Oh. And I think she still thinks that way. Oh, very strange. Uh, indeed. But you know, Angus, there is no more powerful source of ill feeling than the belief that territory has been lost. Mm -hmm. but look, look at all those territorial disputes. Look at South America, for example. Ecuador and Peru argued for years and years over who owned some great chunk of the Amazon basin. And Chile and Argentina were at one another's throats over those islands at the end of the Beagle Channel until the Pope stepped in as mediator. Mm. Do you think you might get involved over your flat? I suppose one might ask. Mm. A risky strategy, I fear. <laughs> but there's more. She's had some renovations done, and she seems to have taken up with her builder. He's Polish. A rather good-looking man, as it happens. They seem to have become very friendly. Oh. Oh. Yes, but, frankly, one wonders what she sees in him. <coughs> he doesn't speak much English, so what do they talk about? Oh, they find something, no doubt. <coughs> Neighbours always seem to have their little ways. Mm. What about those people downstairs? Uh, the ones with that little boy? Oh, little Bertie. Mm. Irene and Stuart Pollock's poor little boy. I bump into him most days on the stairs when he's being dragged off somewhere by that pushy mother of his. Now, Bertie, it's Saturday tomorrow, and how we're looking forward to it, aren't we? Maybe. Perhaps you'd like to... Hush, Stuart. Not maybe, Carissimo. Let's be positive. What have we got coming up? Yoga, then your saxophone lesson, Italian conversazione with mummy, and I'm certainly looking forward to that, I can assure you. And then, in the afternoon, a little session with Dr. Fairbairn. Do I have to, mummy? Do you have to what? Do I have to go to yoga? But you love yoga, Bertie, and it keeps you supple and concentrated. It's terribly important, Bertie, to be supple and concentrated these days. Don't you think Bertie's... Supple enough. I mean, suppleness comes naturally at his age. Yes, Mummy. Daddy's oh. right, I think. Mm. Bertie, there are some things, some very important things that Daddy knows a lot about, and then there are some things that he doesn't know quite so much about. Oh. Well, if I go to yoga, can't that do instead of psychotherapy with Dr. Fairbairn? Sorry, Bertie, but no. Dr. Fairbairn is helping you to cope with growing up. You're extremely fortunate. Many boys can't have psychotherapy. You should appreciate your good fortune. I don't really like Dr. Fairburn all that much, Mummy. His eyes. Mm. He looks at me when I'm talking, and I can see that he's thinking. Of course he's thinking, Bertie. When you talk to psychotherapists, it's their job to think. They think about what you're saying, and then they work out how to offer you stratagems to cope. I'd like to go fishing. Tofu went fishing last weekend. He told me all about it. Yeah. Tofu should not be fishing. Tofu is the son of two entirely respectable vegans. Olive said Tofu's mother died of starvation. <laughs> That's nonsense, Bertie. Absolute <coughs> nonsense. Tofu has a very active imagination. Uh, uh, actually, I wouldn't mind a little fishing trip myself. There are those rather good lochs up in the Pentlands. Ooh. I heard they've got some pretty large trout this year. You see, Mummy, Daddy wants to go fishing. Hmm. Stuart, I suggest that you don't interfere. I have always been in charge of Bertie's Saturdays. <sighs> there, little Ulysses has woken up now. Stuart, would you mind? I suspect he'll need changing. <sighs> All right. The joys of fatherhood. We'll let Daddy do it this time, Bertie. You can change your little brother later on. One thing I was wondering, Mummy. You know Ulysses has got a face. Of course he's got a face, Bertie. What a peculiar thing to say. I've been thinking about his face. He looks just like Dr. Fairburn. Have you noticed it, Mummy? Dr. Fairburn has those ears that go like this, and there's Ulysses with exactly the same ears, just like his. Bertie, you're not to say such things. 
Mummies do not like to hear that their babies look like, like somebody else. It's very tactless, Bertie. But why? Why is it tactless to say something when what you say is true? It just is, Bertie. It just is. Now let's stop talking about it. Let's have a little Italian conversazione. Imagine. That you're in Italy, and you need to get to the railway station. I shall be a lady in the street, and you will call me Signora and ask me for directions. Oh, but first, let's go over our Italian counting, just in case you need to use some number. Uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque. You carry on, Bertie. Se, sette, otto, cento, ventre. Enough Italian numbers, young man. Let me tuck you in. There we are, all safe in bed. Ready for sleep? Yes. And Daddy. Yes, Bertie. Do you think we'll ever be able to go fishing in the pent once?、Hmm. Fishing for trout, big ones.、Oh, I hope so, Bertie. And do you think I shall ever be able to have a Swiss Army penknife, a real one? I hope so, Bertie. Will you talk to Mummy about it? <sighs> I could try. And we could get a tiny penknife for Ulysses.、Hmm. Maybe they make them for Swiss babies. Do you know Ulysses' face, Daddy? His face, Bertie. Yes, he looks just like my psychotherapist. He looks just like Doctor Fairburn, I think.、Uh, not now, Bertie. Time to drop off to sleep. There we are. That's it. <sighs> How easy it is to go to sleep at your age. When you're six, you just close your eyes, don't you? And you're off dreaming about. Well, what do you dream about? I wonder. Swiss Army penknives, going fishing, and talking dogs, and freedom from all the things that weigh you down. Sweet dreams, Bertie. Sweet dreams. Well, it's getting a bit late, so I'd better get back home. Thank you for the coffee, Dominica. My pleasure, Angus. Early evening tomorrow. Oh, you're very kind. Is she in, Antonia? It's hard to tell. Her door looks so discouraging, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, I have a most uneasy feeling that she's plotting something. Really?、Mm, yes, I think that her resentment over this room business is is bubbling away and is going to come out in some surprising way. We must be prepared, Angus. We must be prepared.、Mm, prepared for what? The outbreak of hostilities? Surely not. No, I'm afraid we must. Vigilance, Angus. Vigilance. <coughs> Precisely, Cyril. It's not that I'm a creature of habit. <laughs> well. Perhaps I am, and one of my habits is to start the morning by taking my dog Cyril for a walk in Edinburgh's new town, finishing up in Dundas Street at Big Lou's Cafe, one of the few places that seems prepared to allow dogs to have their morning coffee in peace, metaphorically, of course, curled up at their owner's feet. Big Lou always seems happy to see us. Even if you have to watch out for the barbs in her welcome. Ah, here he is, the great portrait painter himself, the Rayburn de Nogure, and his dog, of course, Cappuccino Angus. As always, Lou. Ah, fine day outside. As I was walking up Dundas Street, I turned round and saw the hills of Fife over on the other side of the Forth, green, yellow here and there, and the sky above them. Ah, I have seen Fife before, been painting. <laughs> yeah, have indeed, Lou. Not a portrait this time. I'm planning something big, really big. 
A painting expressing Scotland's feeling about her past. Aye, best forgotten, I'd say. All they battles. Poor Scotland. Struggling to defend her fragile shores from the English. Aye, because we'd stolen their cattle. Can't blame them for that, I'd say. That was our major industry before we started making whiskey, you know. Stealing English cattle down in the borders. <laughs> then we started to make whiskey and that got the English drunk and they forgot about coming up here to collect their cattle. Here's your coffee. Uh, thank you. Uh, you have a very limited view of history, Lou. Is that what they taught you up in our broth? A realistic view, mere likely. Well, let's not go let's there. Let's not go there. A wonderful expression, Lou. <laughs> but I wonder where there is. Can you imagine the people who are there saying to each other, why is nobody coming here anymore? And somebody will have to explain that it's because people are saying, let's not go there. <laughs> they aren't. Oh, you haver, Mangus. Made it the point. You heard about that incident in the corner, in Great King Street. Somebody was bitten by a dug. Oh, how unfortunate. Block your ears, Cyril. It was the second time in a few days. Apparently, this dug ran out for under a stair, gave a passerby a good nip and then disappeared again. The police have been run. They called in here and asked me if I'd seen any stray dugs hanging about. Very worrying. Cyril, of course, has an alibi. Oh, well, it'll be all right if they round up the usual suspects. Where are you going later, by the way? Dominica's place. Exactly. Oh, well, you're muckle great painting about Scotland in the past. Shouldn't you be doing that? Uh -huh. <laughs> Scotland has been waiting several hundred years for such a painting. It can wait a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> you can leave him out there if you don't mind. Oh, Dominica. Cyril, you'll be fine, won't you? Angus, you come in. Okay. Stay. You'll have had your coffee. As they say these days. <laughs> Indeed I have, but I wouldn't mind... In the kitchen, it's already on. Listen, Angus, I have something very disturbing to tell you. Oh, are you all right, Dominica? I couldn't bear it. Of course I'm all right. No, it's about my neighbour, Antonia. You know, the one who's come back to write a dreadfully tedious book on the lives of the early Scottish scenes. And who has that Polish builder boyfriend, the good-looking Well, the very same... Well, I, I went in there yesterday to deliver a parcel the postie had left with me as she was out. What was in the parcel? Did you find out? Well, I tried. I gave it a good shake, but... It didn't rattle. No. <laughs> but the contents of the parcel are neither here nor there. What I wanted to tell you about was this. She made me a cup of tea, and that was when I made my discovery. It was my teacup. My missing sport cup. The one you were searching for? Yes. It disappeared a few weeks ago when I hunted high and low. I needn't have bothered. It had been liberated by Antonia. Oh, that's... well, that's... that's shocking. It's also, if I may say so, somewhat unbelievable. Why on earth would Antonia want to steal your cup? If she wanted one, she could simply buy it. <laughs> She's not short of money of her. Oh, you shouldn't imagine that people only steal things out of need. Uh, stealing things is, is far more complicated than that. People steal to, to, to satisfy some inner urge. They steal to, to demonstrate their contempt for society and its rules. Yeah. They steal because they secretly want to be caught and get punished. Yeah. They steal because they're bored and are looking for excitement. There are plenty of reasons why people steal. Yeah. In this case, though, I think Antonia has stolen my cup because she feels powerless over what she sees as the expropriation of one of her rooms. If she can't set that to rights, at least she can take something else from me. The blue spode cup, you see, is symbolic. It is a metaphor. Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> there are not many metaphors from which you can drink tea, Angus. But that blue spode cup is one. <laughs> uh, but it's what? all very disappointing. One may not expect much of one's neighbours, but one does expect a certain honesty. Yes, what did you say to her? I said nothing, or, or nothing direct. I, I think I, I said something like, how nice to have tea out of a real cup rather than a mug. And? Well, she simply said that she agreed, that's all. And so then I upped it a bit and said, I've always loved Spode. I have some myself and I'm very fond of it. Well, she must have realised that you knew. Mm. Being able to write a, a book on the lives of the Pictish saints is not the same thing as being sensitive to what people are saying. Frankly, I, I don't see how you can say very much about a culture that seems to have so totally disappeared. Poof! No more pics. Yeah, the pics are indeed a bit of a mystery. Uh, but so is your spode cup. I don't see what we can do about it, though. Have you thought of rising above it, so to speak? Rising gloriously above the whole matter? Uh, possibly even uh, uh, buying a uh, uh, replacement? 
Certainly not. How can one possibly condone something like that? If people ignore the fact that their neighbours have removed their blue sport cups, then where will it end? We'd, we'd be like the Picts. Our entire culture would disappear, and deservedly so. No, Angus. I have a plan. You have a plan? Yes, and a very straightforward one. We get it back. We? Yes. By we, I mean you and I. This is not something one person can accomplish on her own. Assistance will be required. You mean we go into her flat and... We enter, clandestinely, of course. Like the Watergate burglars? Come on, Angus. We have right on our side. We shall not be engaged in some sordid little attempt to find whatever it was the Watergate burglars wanted to find. We shall be engaged in recovering what is rightly ours. Or mine, to be precise. I'm not sure I want to break anybody's door down, least of all Antonia's. But we shall not be breaking her door down. I would never countenance doing anything illegal. I have a key. As her neighbour, I have a key so that if there were an emergency, I could cope with it. Uh -huh. And she is a key holder for me too. In fact, now I come to think of it, that's probably how she got the cup in the first place. She used her key to enter my flat and take it. The nerve of it! I really don't know. Angus, are you prepared to let her get away with it? Are you prepared to do nothing in the face of this most outrageous bit of expropriation that Scotland has witnessed since the English removed the stone of Scone, leaving us no alternative but to steal it back? <laughs> well, I, I exaggerate, of course. Yeah. But this is serious, Angus. We can't stand by. We simply can't. <sighs> oh, well, then... Um... When should we do it? Now. She's out, and I don't expect she'll come back for hours yet. She goes up to the National Library to burrow away over the Pictish Saints, wading through all the non-existent sources. We have a clear window of opportunity. Or, or door, in this case. Let's go. Right now. Uh, Cyril... Uh, uh, Cyril is safely tied up on the landing. We don't want him running around Antonia's flat and disturbing anything. Uh, he'll be fine. Right. Come along. Okay. It's one of these keys. I meant to mark it, but I'll find it. It's all right, Cyril, old chap. We're just going in here for a minute or two. You keep watch. Now, let me see. Oh, keep him quiet, for heaven's sake, Angus. But he's heard something. Well, I didn't. Dogs have better hear. Somebody's coming. He wouldn't bark if there weren't somebody there. Listen. It's on the stairway. I want to call off. It's probably just the people in the flat below. Bertie and his mother and little baby Ulysses. They always make a bit of a din when they go somewhere. Uh, no, I, I'm not going ahead with this. Not right now, anyhow. Some other time. We can do it tomorrow. Oh, very well. Now, come on, Bertie. We can't linger. Daddy's going to meet us at the delicatessen. And if we're to do everything we need to do there and still be in time for your yoga, we are going to have to hurry. Can we miss yoga, Mummy? Couldn't we take Ulysses to Inverleith to feed the ducks? Ulysses is indifferent to ducks, Bertie. He's far too young for that. No, yoga is important, Bertie. And you know that you love it. But I don't, Mummy! Yes, you do, Bertie. Enough of that. And if you're good, I shall get you some pan forte de Siena in the delicatessen. And you may push Ulysses' pram if you are very, very careful. Now, Bertie, you see that pasta up there on that high shelf? Daddy will lift you up so you can reach it. Yes. Ready? Up we go. No, the one on the left. Yep, up you go, Bertie. That's it. Well done. Pass it down to Mummy. Whee! What about Pan Forte di Siena, Mummy? Should we get some now? All in good time, Bertie. I want to get some sun-dried tomatoes, and Daddy will want to get some wine. Uh, yeah, right. I'll go off and choose a couple of bottles, then I'll get back to the flat. I'll do the butchers on the way. And Ulysses... That's is... fine, Stuart. Bertie and I will cope. Well, goodbye then. See you in an hour or so. Bye. Bye-bye, Daddy. Daddy loves drinking, doesn't he, Mummy? I suppose you could call it his hobby. Hush, Bertie. <laughs> Don't say things like that. Daddy enjoys an occasional glass of wine, that's all. 
You like drinking too, don't you, Mummy? In moderation, Bertie. Now, let's go and pay for these things and then hurry along to yoga. If we walk quickly, we'll get there in time and you won't miss the cobra position salute to the sun. Such fun, that looks to me. Such engaging fun. But, Mummy! Come on, Bertie. Don't linger. Yoga starts in five minutes and we'll still get there in time if you don't dawdle. There's no danger, as I've told you many times, in treading on the lines. The bears will not get you. There are no bears, Bertie. Non ci sono orsi a Edimburgo, Bertie. They do not exist, at least in Edinburgh. Mummy, can I ask you something? There's no time for questions. But it's important. What, Bertie, what? Where's Ulysses? What? Didn't you leave his pram at the delicatessen? Of course not, Bertie. Daddy took him home. But when Daddy left, I saw him through the shop window. I saw him waving, and he didn't have Ulysses with him. Bertie, are you sure? Yes, quite sure. You forgot Ulysses, Mummy. Is that what you did? You forgot him. Quick, Bertie. We must run back as fast as we possibly can. I'm sure he'll be all right. Yes, madam. There was a pram there, but we thought it had been abandoned. We couldn't find MD in charge of it, so I'm afraid we called the police. They took it away. The pram with the baby in it. You had no right. The police were most concerned, madam. It's very irresponsible. Is that the end of Ulysses, Mummy? Certainly not, Bertie. Ulysses will be perfectly happy at the police station. We'll go there directly. So no yoga today, Mummy? Yoga can wait, Bertie. In the circumstances, there are other priorities. Good. No yoga. And no little brother either. Poor Ulysses. Mummy, do you think Ulysses is the youngest person ever to be arrested in Scotland? Do you think so, Mummy? So begins another day, and here I am out with my dog, Cyril. The streets of Edinburgh are bathed in sunlight, or oh, semi-sunlight, shall I say. We are a touch northern in our situation, and the sun tends to be, uh, well, slightly to the south of us. I take such pleasure in walking each morning along those stone pavements, under those towering Georgian tenements, to my morning cup of coffee at Big Lou's Cafe. Well, Angus, what do you make of the headlines in the paper of the day? Your usual. The usual rules. The headlines are oh, pretty shocking, I imagine. Not that I've actually seen them. What do they say? Goings on in Dundee. Awful goings on. Uh, well, such things happen. I rather suspect that there are goings on everywhere, more or less. Some places, I believe, are an absolute hotbed of goings on. It doesn't really bear thinking about. Your coffee. Thank you, Lou. Now, listen, I have a request. I'm listening. Yes, you see, how shall I put this? An issue. Yes, an, an issue has arisen down in Scotland Street where, as you may know, my friend Domenica MacDonald lives. Ah, yes, sweetheart. Uh, would that were true, Lou? <laughs> she is just a friend, I assure you. Not that I would have it otherwise. Ah, that may be so, but you were saying. Yes, um, I was saying that an issue has arisen, extremely delicate. It centres around a certain, how shall I put it, a certain object that has been um, removed without authority. Pinched? So it appears. By? Uh, well, that's not absolutely certain. Uh, possibly a neighbour. You can't be certain about these things until you have the proof. But no matter. What we, that's Domenica and I, plan to do is to retrieve this object, to restore it, shall I say, to its proper position, which is, as I've said, not the position it is now in. You want to nick it back? It's not a question of nicking anything. You don't nick stolen property, for heaven's sake, Lou. You, you restore it. Well? Well, I wondered if I might leave Cyril here with you for a little while, probably no more than an hour, while Domenica and I engage in our rather sensitive mission. Will he behave himself? 
You've heard about that dug round the corner getting into all that trouble with the police for serial biting. Cyril would never do that. Cyril is beyond reproach, I assure you. Ah, all right. No for long, mind. No, no, not for long. Thank you, Lou. Now, Angus, are you ready? I am. <coughs> I must confess to a certain nervousness about all this, but bearing that in mind and putting it to one side, so to speak, I might roughly be described as ready. Hmm? Uh, but may I ask you something? Why do you need me? Couldn't you do this by yourself? But this is an adventure, Angus, and it's far better to share an adventure with a friend, and safer too sometimes. You're safer? Well, we can't be absolutely certain that nothing will go wrong, can we? So having two of us is a bit better, I think. And there's no need for nervousness, you know. <laughs> no need for nervousness. <laughs> Forgive me, Dominica, but you sound rather like Lady Macbeth, encouraging Macbeth to screw his courage to the sticking place, or whatever she said to him when he was expressing reservation about disposing of Duncan. <laughs> and look what happened to Macbeth. It's a salutary story. Nonsense. Macbeth was dreadfully weak. This will be perfectly simple. I have the key to Antonia's flat, and all that I'm proposing we do is let ourselves in and retrieve my blue spot teacup that she so outrageously purloined from me. There's nothing illegal about taking back what's rightfully yours. And breaking into someone else's flat? Nothing illegal about that. We are not breaking in. We have the key. I am fully entitled to enter to deal with an emergency, and in my view, that is exactly what we're doing. Any further questions? I merely raised my concern. And I hope I've allayed yeah, Are you sure she's out? I heard her going down the stairs. She'll be up at the National Library now and will not hear anything of her for at least six hours. The coast, as they say, is clear. Here we are. She hasn't washed up the breakfast it's, things. That doesn't surprise me in the least. It's but a small step from stealing spoiled teacups to leaving the washing up undone. <clears throat> Where is it, anyway? It doesn't seem to be on that shelf. It looks as if she keeps her cups there, and none of them is blue spoiled. I imagine that she secreted it away somewhere. After all, one would not normally leave stolen property in full view of anybody who walks into one's kitchen. Uh, there's that cupboard over there. Oh, that's her walk-in pantry, I believe. It could be there. Let's take a look. Rather dark. My mobile can be used as a torch if I can find the correct button. Oh, there we are. Let there be light, so to speak. It feels very odd, this, to be walking into somebody else's cupboard uninvited. Look, over there. That, I would say, is my cup. Well, it's it's blue and it's spooled. Hold my phone, Angus. Let me see. Yes, this, Angus, is my blue spoiled teacup. I distinctly remember that hairline crack there, and the glaze was a little thicker near the base as it is here. Yes, I can positively identify this cup as my own. The cheek of the woman, the sheer breathtaking effrontery. Good, then we can get out of here. That sounds like the front door. Perhaps it's just the post. No, that's not the post. It's Antonia coming home. We shall have to say we heard a suspicious noise and came to investigate. Or, or, or smelt some yeah, But why would we be in a cupboard? Being in somebody's cupboard is, I think, generally inconsistent with an innocent purpose. Oh, really, Angus, here we are in a cupboard, and you have to go on and on about... Being in a cupboard, which is very much the same as being in a tight corner. No, we're caught red-handed, Domenico. We're going to jail. Shh. Who's with her? What are they up to? Listen. It's a man. Antonia has a man with her. I do believe it's our Polish builder friend. I'm not sure I want to hear this. They're coming through here. Close the door. Coffee or tea, Marcus? Oh, coffee. I'll have coffee too. I was so pleased to bump into you. Yes, coffee. Coffee, very good. In Poland, we drink a lot of coffee too. Mm, that's so reassuring. Why don't you sit down? There we are. Comfy? Yes, very comfy. And I put on some music. Here's a treat for you. Chopin. <laughs> oh, I just remember. I must get something from my truck downstairs. Little present for you. Ah. Just for you. <laughs> oh, Marcus, you're an angel. You just let yourself out and the coffee will be ready when you come back. Ah, some post. What are we going to do? It could be here for hours. 
unless she's distracted in some way. But I don't see how we could do that. Unless... Unless her phone is in the sitting room. She hasn't got a phone here in the kitchen. So? Well, if her phone rang, she'd have to go off and answer it. That would give us time to nip out the front door. It's our only chance. Yeah, but it may not ring. Ah, but that's where you're wrong. I have my mobile here, and I have her number on it. <laughs> Domenica, you're brilliant. With one bound, we'll be free. Now then, yes, here we are. Antonia Colley. Here goes. Are you ready, Angus? Yes. Got the cup? In my hand. Right. Give it a moment. Right. She's going. Now. Now's our chance. <laughs> Yes? Who is it? <laughs> Hello? Is this a marketing call? <laughs> we did it! Quick, back into my flat. Yes, we did, didn't we? We struck a blow for justice. Yes, well, that might be taking it a bit far. At least we can see that we got your cup back. Come on, Angus. That might be her friend. Uh, no, it's the Pollocks. Bertie and that mother of his on their way out. Come on, Angus. Inside. We shall celebrate the return of the cup. <laughs> Why have they kept Ulysses so long, Mummy? They've had him since yesterday. Ever since you left him in the delicatessen. I didn't leave him there, Bertie. It was all a misunderstanding. I thought Daddy had taken him, and Daddy thought I was going to do that. It was nobody's fault, Bertie. But the police thought it was, Mummy. Wasn't that why they've kept him so long? Because they think you're not a suitable person to have a baby? That's utter nonsense, Bertie. I won't have you saying such things. It was red tape, Bertie. Bureaucracy. They claimed, claimed, mind you, that they had to establish my identity and then get his release approved by the head of some obscure department. Ridiculous. But there we are. So now we've to collect him from the social work department. How very, very... I suppose they don't want any old person coming along and claiming a missing baby. I am not any old person, Bertie. But at least we're getting Ulysses back. That's the important thing. We take a very serious view of this, Mrs Pollock. Your baby was abandoned at the entrance of a supermarket. <laughs> abandoned? He was left sleeping in his pram for no more than a few minutes. That is not abandonment in my view. And it was a delicatessen, not a supermarket. Middle-class neglect is exactly the same as any other neglect, Mrs Pollock. You have another child, I gather. I don't see what business it is of yours whether I have another child. Oh, but it is our business, Mrs Pollock. Child protection is definitely our business. We get people in here who lose track of how many children they have. Would you believe it? Oh, really, this is outrageous. As it happens, I have one other child. Satisfied? A boy or a girl? A boy. He's called Bertie and he's six. Who's looking after him at the moment? I am. You? Yes. I do happen to be his mother, you know. But where is he? I don't see him. He's... he's outside. He wanted to sit outside. There was a bench. He'll be perfectly safe. You've let a six-year-old sit on a bench... by himself. <laughs> by himself? Oh, really? Bertie will be perfectly safe. There's very little chance of his falling off the bench, and it's right outside your front door. Now, would you please hand over my baby and stop interfering? Dealing with parental neglect is not interference. Neglect? Neglect? Are you accusing me of neglecting my own child? I'm not making any accusations, Mrs Pollock. Merely observations. Well, I have no interest in your observations. Now, for the last time, will you please hand over my baby? You may pick him up yourself. He's through in the nursery, the one there on the left. He's nicely wrapped up in that shawl we found him in. They're all asleep, so please don't wake the others. 
Oh, Angus, you're back. Sorry, Lou. It took slightly longer than I had thought. A little difficulty en route to a successful conclusion. No more than that. Uh, where's Cyril? Cyril. Well, now, um, there's a slight hitch with Cyril, I'm afraid. Slight hitch? Where's my dog, Lou? Well, come over here and sit uh, No, no, wait. Is he all right? Is there something wrong, Lou? Cyril is safe. It's just that he's no here. He's uh, run away. No, no that. You know that issue with the dog round the corner, the dog that's been biting people. Yeah, what has that got to do with Cyril? Well, the police called, and I'm sorry to say they well, they arrested Cyril. They think it's him. Arrested? But that's outrageous. Where did they take him? To Gayfield Square Police Station. They said you could come and visit him there if you wanted to. They have a cell there they use for dogs. Cell? This is awful, Lou. Cyril's absolutely innocent. Well, Bertie, we have our dear little baby Ulysses back in the bosom of his family. All's well that ends well. Although we mustn't normally use such resounding clichés. What's a cliché, Mummy? A cliché, Bertie, is any expression we don't like that is used by people other than ourselves. That's not the definition, Bertie. Your father is having his little joke. (laughs) A cliché is an overused expression. Language becomes tired when we use the same words over and over again. You you know, I mean... I can't believe that you left Ulysses at the deli. I mean, I I really find it difficult to to come to terms with that. I'm sorry, but I do. Excuse me, I left Ulysses. You keep saying I left Ulysses. Let me remind you, Stuart, that Ulysses has two parents and that both these parents, namely you and I, were present. I happened to be engaged in the purchase of necessities to keep this family going and you, well, you decided to go back to the flat when quite reasonably I believed that you would be watching our son. But no, you were on your way back to Scotland Street without a thought as to who was looking after your younger son. Irene. So don't you start to reproach me, Stuart Pollock. Irene, I... Oh, really, I wish people wouldn't phone at awkward moments. Stuart, could you attend to this? I'm a bit late for the office. Would you mind? <clears throat> Bertie, you go and change your little brother. I told you how to do it. Do I have to? Yes, you do, Bertie. Changing nappies is every bit as much male work as it is female. Daddy knows that. Don't well, you, Stuart? Well, yes, but Bertie's just... Later, Stuart, off you go to the office. You and I can have a little chat about parental responsibilities later on. I have to get that wretched phone. Bye, Bertie. Bye-bye, Daddy. Hello, what is it? Oh, yes, the book club. Uh, Well, according to my diary, we decided on the Tuesday after next... Go and change the little Ulysses, Bertie. I'll be getting a note out to all the members, you included. And what book are we discussing? What what did you choose? I can't remember. The book? I I thought we'd agreed that. The Deconstruction of Children's Literature. I've already read it, and it's full of challenging ideas. There's quite a devastating treatment of the Baba stories. Baba stories? No, they are not harmless, not by any means. He most definitely wasn't French. He was an elephant, and elephants are not necessarily French. Well, that's how colonialism works. And as a good French elephant, he is duly rewarded by being made king of the elephants. Is that right? Discuss. I know they like it, but that's not the point. Children like all sorts of things they shouldn't like. Listen, I have a gurning baby on my hands and a husband and son to supervise. I'm going to have to go. Get the book and we can carry on our discussion at the meeting. Goodbye. Really, some people, one despairs. Mummy, can you come first to Yoris' room? What is it, Bertie? Changing a nappy is absolutely straightforward. I've shown you several times already, and you can't expect Mummy to drop everything and come running to show you how to do something you already know how to do. You can't expect that, can you, Bertissimo? But, Mummy, this is really important. It's to do with Ulysses. Is Ulysses all right, Bertie? Where's Daddy? Daddy's gone to work, and yes, Ulysses is all right. He's on his changing mat on the floor. He can't go anywhere. Then what's the problem, Bertie? Mummy is really very busy, you know. Well, you know how boys and girls... Well, boys and girls are different. 
Bertie, listen to me. How many times have I told you that boys and girls are not different? It's society, Bertie, that imposes different roles on boys and girls. We're all the same to begin with. All the same. Are you sure, Mummy? Of course, Mummy's sure. Mummy has even written an article about this, Bertie. I'd give you a copy to read, but even with your very impressive vocabulary, some of the words are maybe just a little bit long. Anyway, having corrected that that misunderstanding on your part, what is all this about Ulysses? He's different. Different. What can you possibly mean, Bertie? He's just, just. Different. I was telling you, boys and girls are different, or I used to think they were. Bertie, this is getting us nowhere. Different in what way? Well, you know how boys have. You know what I mean, Mummy. Boys have, and then girls don't really, or I don't think they do. You see, it's a bit complicated, and you say used to have. Well, he was a boy, you see, and now he looks more like a girl. But I'm not sure, you see, Mummy, because I don't really know. And you've just said there's no difference between boys and girls, and I think maybe I've got it wrong. Now look, Bertie, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say this, Mummy. I think Ulysses is really a girl. Social Work Department Nursery, can I help you? Yes, this is Irene Pollock. I recently came to collect my infant son, Ulysses. Oh yes, earlier today. Yes, I was the person you saw, Mrs. Pollock. Is everything all right? It most certainly is not. You may recall that I have a son, not a daughter. That's correct. Let me see. Yes, here it is. Ulysses Pollock, aged one. Well, you've given me the wrong baby. What? I said, you've given me the wrong baby. We seem to have a girl in our possession. My other son went to change the nappy and discovered that we've been given a girl. But that's ridiculous. Surely you know your own baby. You went to collect him from the nursery, as I recall. How could you get it wrong? Don't ask me how I could get it. How, how could you get it wrong? You'd wrapped our baby's shawl around somebody else's baby. I, I saw the shawl and naturally assumed that it was little Ulysses. The babies were well wrapped up. I couldn't see their faces. If you're going to obscure babies' faces, then all sorts of mistakes are going to be made. Uh, don't you tell me my job. You're the one who mislaid your baby in the first place, leaving him unattended outside a supermarket. It was not a supermarket. It was a delicatessen. You obviously have no idea of the difference, so perhaps it's no surprise that you can't tell one baby from another. But the point is not your incompetence, but this. Have you got a baby boy there? As it happens, we do. Then that'll be Ulysses. I'm coming to collect him and to bring this other baby back, and I want no red tape or nonsense of any sort, if you don't mind. Mr. Lordy, please sit down. Thank you. I hope you haven't been kept waiting unduly. Mm. My last case dragged on and on. Such a little matter, but you know how litigants can be. But there we are. Now, this distressing question of your dog. Cyril. Yes, your dog Cyril and his... Uh, his Arrest. Uh, of course, his arrest. Now, I have here a preliminary report from the police, and I see that your dog was arrested in a coffee bar in Dundas Street, having been spotted by a member of the public who identified him as the dog who had bitten her several days previously in Great King Street. Cyril would never do that. He just wouldn't. I know my dog, you see. Yes, I understand, Mr Lordy, but we have to confront the facts as they are presented to us, and indeed to the Procurator Fiscal, who will determine what course of action is to be taken. The police, you see, say that they carried out an identity parade, and one of the other victims also identified your dog as the culprit. <laughs> That's absurd. How can you have an identity parade of dogs? Would they all be the same breed? Yeah, uh, yes, I, I suppose that could pose problems. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Very droll. Imagine a lineup of dogs of different breeds, a Daxie next to a Great Dane and a Poodle next to a Bulldog. <laughs> Most droll. I don't see the humour in the situation. Uh, no, uh, of course not. Of course not. I, in fact, it's 
It's very serious indeed, I'm afraid, because the Sheriff Court has the power to, uh, well, dangerous dogs can't be allowed to run round unchecked. I'm afraid the situation really looks rather dire, Mr Lord. But Cyril is completely innocent. I shall do my best to challenge the identification, but they have several witnesses now, I'm afraid. A sorry tale, Angus. Very worrying indeed. In fact, we're both in, how shall I put it, an uneasy situation. You too? Why? Well, the, the issue of the blue spode teacup. But you have it back. We successfully and covertly retrieved it from your light-fingered neighbour. That at least is something we can be pleased about. Yes, I have it back. And you may notice I have just served your tea in it. Aye, and very delicious it is too. And you may observe, I'm about to pour my own tea into a blue spored teacup too. So you have two. These things often travel in pairs, I think. Mm, I have two now, but I didn't have two in the past. In fact, until we liberated my cup from Antonia's, I thought I only had one. I don't follow you. Well, I've always had one blue spored teacup. Now I seem to have two, which prompts the conclusion that the cup we took back from Antonia's was really hers. My own turned up in my own flat. I must have looked straight past it. There was a bowl in front of it on the shelf, and I suppose that obscured it somewhat. Oh, see. Yes. Embarrassing, isn't it? That teacup was hers all along. And it gets worse. Uh -huh. She came to tea with me earlier today, and she spotted both cups on the shelf and said, I used to have a cup like that, but it seems to have gone missing. Most odd. So we've stolen her blue spode cup. Mm, so it would appear. Uh, but in good faith, of course. Oh, I never thought I would become a thief. It just goes to show how strange can be the twists and turns of fate. Well, what do we do? Oh, that, Angus, is the question that lies at the heart of every human dilemma. Political, social, economic and psychological. What do we do? You put it so elegantly. So, what do we do? I haven't the faintest idea, Angus. The fact that one puts the question elegantly, as, as you so kindly say, doesn't mean one has any answers. We could do nothing, of course. Oh, yes. To do nothing is always an option, and quite an attractive one. Would you vote for a political party that promised to do nothing? I think an awful lot of people would. Oh, Domenica, I just don't know. Suddenly life has become rather too complicated. I'm so worried about Cyril. Oh, I'm sure things will turn out all right. Are you? Well, I'm not. And it's life and death for him. You know what happens to dogs who go around biting people? Oh, come on, Angus. It won't be that bad. It will be, I'm afraid. It'll be the end of Cyril. Unless something turns up. Which it won't. Life, you know, isn't like one of those novels where a ship suddenly appears to rescue the marooned sailors or the cavalry comes charging round the corner. And yet there must have been cases where ships did appear and cases, too, where the cavalry actually did turn up in the nick of time. I have a positive feeling about Cyril's case. How can you possibly feel positively about it? Because what's the alternative? Well, you have no answer to that, do you? Well, there you are. Shall we go for a walk? Yes, let's. There's a band playing in Princess Street Gardens, I believe. Then we shall go and listen. If bands do us the courtesy of playing, the least we can do is listen to them. It's only polite. <sighs> Take my arm, Domenica. Certainly, Angus. Shall we go? You know, Domenica, it... It's very good just to be with you. Well, I'm glad to hear it. I've sometimes wondered... Yes, Angus. What have you wondered? Whether we... Yes? Whether we might... Whether we might perhaps go for a walk more often. <sighs> It's curious, isn't it, how empty a house may seem when its familiar spirit, a cat or a dog, is absent. I was so used to the presence of my faithful dog, Cyril, that during his absence 
in Durance Vile, otherwise known as Gayfield Square Police Station, I found myself unable to do very much. Poor Cyril, accused of biting strangers and facing... well. But then, in the midst of all this gloom, I received a summons to the police station. I hardly dared hope for good news, and so I steeled myself to being told that Cyril had lost his case, such as it was, and that I was now required to say good-bye to him. With leaden heart, I made my way to the police station and presented myself at the front desk. <coughs> I received a message to come here. My name is Lordy, Angus Lordy, and I'm the owner of, of the innocent dog, Cyril. Oh, yes, Mr. Lordy, of course. Well, your dog's ready to go. Off to court? No, of course not. To go home, he's released. Hi. I can't believe it. Well, it's true. The whole thing's been a mistake. We don't always get it right. Can you tell me what happened? Yes. Uh, while your dog was here, safely locked up, there was another incident. A dog ran out and nipped somebody's ankles at the junction of Dundas Street and Harriet Row. Well, a member of the public had the good judgment to follow this dog and see where he went. That's how we got hold of his address. The rest was pretty straightforward. That dog is now helping us with our inquiries, as the expression has it. I told you, I told you he was innocent. I'm sorry we weren't able to listen to you. Mind you, all dogs are innocent, aren't they? I mean, no animal can be called to account for what it does. Aristotle was right about the need for responsibility to be based on free choice, wasn't he? Aristotle? Yes, I suppose he was. You didn't expect that, did you? Well, we are the Edinburgh police after all. Or Police Scotland is my no title. Now, I expect you'd like to be reunited with your dog. I would indeed. Then follow me. <laughs> he appears to be pleased to see you. I see that you're reunited. Yes, Lou. Cyril, as you've observed, is free. Well, I am very relieved. He was innocent after all. <laughs> ah, here's your cup. That runneth over. <laughs> huh? Metaphorically, of course, Lou. Aye, metaphorically. Happiness. Yes, Lou. Yeah, happiness. Happiness comes in so many different forms, doesn't it? Sometimes unexpectedly, sometimes because we've tried to be happy. And succeeded. <laughs> yes, I suppose so. Although that's a bit questionable, don't you think? I'm not sure whether people should tell others to try to be happy... I'm no sure that I go along with the idea that we have a duty to be happy, to look happy. Does anybody say that? Well, oh, plenty of folk tell us that we should be happy. Advertisers, for example. People who want to sell us things. Look at their pictures. Everybody's smiling. Mm -hmm. Buy this, buy that, and you'll find happiness. Smile away. Photographers. What about them? Well, that's what they say, isn't it? Mm. Out comes the camera and we're told to smile. You have to. When did that start, I wonder? Look at old photographs and you'll see that people just looked natural. You had a range of expressions. Now everybody believes they should smile in a photograph. <laughs> Somehow it's not a proper picture. Oh, maybe. You know something, Angus? Do you ever ask your friends whether they're happy? Probably not. Maybe we should. You, for instance. You're happy now that Cyril's returned, but what about tomorrow or the day after? Will you be happy then? Yeah, who knows? Cheerful enough, I suppose, like most people. I get along. But you could be happier. Well, everybody could be happier. You could be happier if... with Domenica. I might be. And she might too. Well, I'm not sure that that's what she'd want. I think she may want just that. She's fonder of you than you imagine, Angus. <laughs> How would you know that, Lou? A woman's intuition. Ah, I see. Mm. And men's intuition? Do men have intuition? That's a question for men to answer. <laughs> I see. Well, I suppose I have at least some intuition, and intuitively, I want to have a party oh. to celebrate the return of Cyril, and the fact... Well, the fact of so many things. Friendship, neighbourhood, the sheer fact of being here at this time, in our brief moment. At your place? Oh, too messy. At Domenica's. She likes a party. You'll come, Lou? I'll be there. Oh. oh, this do 
door. How do they expect us to open it when we're so heavily laden? Mrs MacDonald, can I carry those things for you? Oh, there you are, Bertie. Well, that's very kind of you. If you're a Cub Scout, you can consider it your good deed of the day. I'm not allowed to join the Cubs. My mother says it's a paramilitary organisation, and she doesn't believe in paramilitary organisations. Oh, I see. Well, be that as it may, Bertie, the doing of a good deed a day is a good thing, I would have thought. You take these two packets and I'll manage the rest. What are these for, Mrs MacDonald? We're having a party, Bertie. That's Mr Lordy, you know, the man with the dog. Mm -hmm. He and I are having a party. We've got Ulysses back, you know. Mummy left him at the delicatessen. Oh. And we had to get him back from the social work nursery. <gasps> we got the wrong baby at first, but then we got the right one. Oh, really? How very interesting, Bertie. It was a mistake, you see. Ah, a mistake. Well, we can all make mistakes, can't we? My father says it's very important to say sorry if you make a mistake. You should just go and say sorry. I think that's the best thing to do, too. Do you, Bertie? Yes, I do. Oh, well, that's very interesting, Bertie. You know, I made a mistake a day or two ago, mm -hmm. quite a bad one, about a blue spode teacup. Mm -hmm. And I think the advice you've just given me is spot on. I'm not telling you what to do, Mrs MacDonald. Of course you aren't, Bertie. You're just giving sound advice. And I propose to follow it. <laughs> you know this party we're planning, Bertie? Would you all like to come? You, your parents, and even little Ulysses? I'd love that, Mrs MacDonald. Good. Well, you go and tell your parents about it. And if they're free, we shall see you all at six o'clock. And I, in the meantime, shall have a word with our neighbour, Antonia. Domenica, how nice to see you. Oh, Antonia. Care to come in? Well, I'm a bit pressed for time. Um, I... I come to invite you to a party. Six o'clock, across the landing. With your friend, if you wish to bring him. Marcus. Hmm, I'm sure he'd love it. And the, the second thing I have to do is this. I owe you an apology. I have your blue spode teacup. I took it from your flat in the belief that it was mine, having thought I'm ashamed to say that you had taken it from me. I had no right to do this, and I was entirely in the wrong. I ask for your forgiveness. I see. Well, I, I would not be in the least surprised if you were angry. I would be angry in your shoes. I shall rise above it. I shall not allow myself to be angry. Oh. I shall remember those early Scottish saints who rose above so much. The provocations of the Picts, mm. the general prevailing darkness. Of course, of course. So the matter is closed? Yes. What time did you say the party was? Six. You needn't bring anything. You have enough cups. I mean glasses. Ah, quite enough, thank you. Six o'clock, then. Le Tour Scotland Street will be there. Le Tour. Ah, the delegation from downstairs. Stuart and Bertie, how nice to see you. Thanks uh, for the invitation, uh, and, and for including Bertie and little Ulysses. Um, Irene will be up with Ulysses in a minute or two. We're the advance party. Very good. Bertie, come with me and you can pass round the crisps and, of course, help yourself. Can I, Daddy? Go for it, Bertie. Go for it. Party fit. Great. Angus, you talk to Stuart. Yes, of course, <clears throat> so, uh, a neighbourhood party is always, always such fun. Oh, of course it is. We have so much to talk about, and it's, um, it's often difficult just meeting on the stairs or in the street outside. <laughs> Where does one start? Where indeed? Uh, so yes. <laughs> well, there we are. Yeah, yes, yes, indeed. Here we are. Uh, so. Um, well, what do you think about the referendum? Uh, no, no, I wasn't going to bring that up after all this time. <laughs> Although it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yes, it, it is, isn't it? I mean, who would it? have thought that... Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't think I did. Did you? No, 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 I, 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 
I, I, I didn't. Uh, not in so many words. Mm -hmm. Funny that. Because many people thought that, um... Well, well, they thought. They thought, didn't they? It was fascinating. Uh, well, if you don't mind, I, I must just have a word with Domenica. Sure. I think everybody seems to be enjoying themselves well enough, don't you? Yes, they do. Even young Bertie. Look, he's engaged in very earnest conversation over there with Antonia. <laughs> yes, and I had a good chat with her Polish boyfriend. Nice man, I think, although we, we couldn't talk about very much. Now, the important thing is she's happy. Is that the most important thing in life? Happiness? Yes. Oh, I'm not sure. There's maybe a sense in which happiness keeps us from seeing things as they really are. And if that's the case, then I'm not sure it can be the most important thing in life. And yet, people pursue happiness relentlessly. Mm. What other goals can our sort of society have? Well, enlightenment. The dispelling of the darkness. Mm, not easy to do. Well, no, not easy. But probably a bit more manageable if one has somebody to help you dispel the darkness. Possibly. Do you think that perhaps... Yes. You mean, yes, we could, possibly? Yes, possibly. Oh, what about Cyril? Must he always be marooned on the landing outside? His, uh, his status could change. You'd let him in? Probably. Oh, Domenico! You really are quite remarkable. Oh, not really. No, but you are. Oh, don't get carried away. Have another glass of wine. <laughs> I, I think we've run out of glasses. Ah. Ah. But we do have a blue spode cup. I gave Antonia hers back, but I still have mine. Oh, I never thought I'd see myself drinking wine out of a blue spode teacup. Then close your eyes and you'll see nothing. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Open your eyes and raise your blue spored teacup. Uh, your blue spored teacup. Indeed. E except, you know, Angus, I thought mine had the, the smallest chip just above the handle. This doesn't seem to have that. Oh, so what does that mean? It means there might have been a mistake. Uh, don't go there, Domenica. Just don't go there. Go where? Uh, to wherever you were thinking of going. Oh, there? <laughs> yes. To us, Domenica. To you and me. To you and me, Angus. <laughs> you know, I'm so glad that we've still got the accusative case. So many people these days say, to you and I. <laughs> well, they're wrong. <laughs> and we're right? Yes. You and me, we're right. Even if what you've just said is wrong. Even if, Domenica, even if. In 44 Scotland Street, the Blue Spode Teacup, written and dramatised by Alexander McCall Smith, you heard David Jackson Young as Stuart, Emma Curry as Irene, Anita Vitesse as Antonia, Carol Ann Crawford as Domenica, Crawford Logan as Angus, and Simon Kerr as Bertie. Other parts were played by Molly Innes and Matthew Zarjak. It was produced and directed by David Ian Neville.